This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, I want to talk about the power of the human imagination and the power of identity in the last days. Now, that may sound complicated, but it's not complicated. I want you to think for a moment. I want you to travel back into time when you were a school student, let's say in high school. Um, let's imagine for a moment that you have gone back in time and you have revisited your school in the general time period when either you were going through puberty or many of your friends were going through puberty. Now, I know that's a very personal thing, and it's probably somewhat <coughs> inappropriate to ask people to to go back to that time period, but you don't have to announce it publicly. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to capture an age category. Now, that age category is different for different people. The experience of puberty could be 12 years old. It could be younger than that. It could be 14 years old. There's a, there's a somewhat wide range of ages where that biological transition into womanhood or manhood occurs. And it, it appears to be getting younger as uh, the years go by, especially among females. I'm not here to comment about the fact that it's happening at a younger period, but we would all agree that puberty is the transition of a boy or a girl into manhood or uh, womanhood in the sense that when the uh, transition or transformation of puberty is, is finished, that boy becomes a man, that woman or that girl becomes a woman in the sense that they are now capable of reproducing. And along with that capacity to reproduce, there are some uh, noticeable <clears throat> fundamental changes in, in every human being that goes through that process. The, the, the fundamental changes are, for males, um, the male's voice becomes deeper. Uh, you could say more masculine. Uh, the male will often have an exponential spurt of growth physically. The, the muscle mass and the amount of muscles on, on a male will uh, increase. Uh, uh, facial hair and hair uh, on other parts of the body or other parts of the anatomy is an observable, observable feature when people go through puberty. And, and one of the reasons for that, there's a number of biochemical changes, but testosterone, especially among males, is one of the driving forces. The hormone testosterone is a driving force in bringing uh, a young boy into puberty and in manhood because testosterone in conjunction with other uh, hormones and biochemicals uh, makes the transformation from boyhood into manhood. So boys become much stronger physically. They become much, much stronger physically. And uh, deeper voices and all kinds of things. Now, in addition to that, with males and females, there <clears throat> are accompanying changes in, in the person's psychological identity. In other words, the, the <clears throat> child is, is growing up uh, as a uh, little girl or a little boy, but when uh, their biology or God uh, causes them to enter puberty, there's a, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, randomness, there's a certain amount of spontaneity, there's a certain amount of things that go out of control because of the, of the transformation. In other words, the young boy who is now becoming a young man is faced with all these new feelings and emotions and passions and energies uh, that he didn't have before. 
and it's often confusing, and it can often produce a time of rebellion. This is when a lot of uh, teenagers and preteens, they go into a rebellious period uh, during the time of period, uh, the time of of puberty because of this uh, thing that's happening. And so there's uh, sometimes mood swings, there's flashes of anger, there's, there's things are just disordered. And they're disordered because, because the, the boy is becoming a man and transformation occurs. Now, for the female, the young girl, she experiences a similar but slightly different set of changes, also brought on, on by a biological clock brought on by powerful hormonal changes. Her hormonal changes are slightly different, but she experiences hormonal changes, uh, changes in biochemistry, and she transforms from uh, a little girl into a woman. And with that uh, comes along powerful biological changes in both her mind and her body. The shape of her body transforms from uh, the the body of a little girl and uh, gradually uh, reforms itself uh, into the body of a woman. And without <clears throat> being indiscreet, the body of a woman obviously is different than the body of a little girl. So the, the uh, little girl who is transitioning into um, uh, womanhood uh, again, I want to be discreet and tasteful, because she is now entering a new realm in her identity, where she is now uh, a being, a feminine being, a woman, who is capable of being a mother, who is capable of giving birth. That's, that's the fundamental core transformation that's going on underneath. She's moving from <clears throat> childhood, or being a girl, to a woman who has now the biological capacity to reproduce, to give birth to a child. And as such, her body goes through a number of uh, powerful changes. The shape of her body, uh, the size of uh, certain parts of her anatomy uh, uh, will transform because um, she biologically will now have the capacity, uh, if she gets pregnant and bears children, her body now has to have the biological capacity to nourish um, her offspring. And I don't need to go into the specifics. We all know what I'm talking about. So there's a change in that. There's there's a visible change in that part of her anatomy. Also, because her body is now transforming and uh, capable of uh, of actually giving birth uh, to a child. The the part of her anatomy uh, where the baby will come out of the birth canal. That entire part of the anatomy, from the the outward part. To, to the inner part, undergoes tremendous transformation. There's a widening and a transformation of her hips, etc., etc. Okay, we know, again, we know what, we, what I'm talking about. And then, of course, um, a girl, um, the, the hallmark of the transition is uh, that a young girl will at the appropriate point, and it differs, it differs from girl to girl, she'll have a menstrual period. And that is the uh, biological signal that she's now capable of, of giving birth because she also has a menstrual cycle. And along with the menstrual cycle is a, a calendar period in, in cycles such as months where she is at the highest level of fertility and at the lowest level of fertility. But the point is, she has now transitioned from being a little girl to being potentially fertile. And along with that goes a powerful transformation of hormones and biochemicals. And and for both the boy who has become a man 
And for both the, the little girl who has become a woman, again, there's these confusing emotions, confusing passions. Now, I'm not simply talking about um, sexual passions and confusion uh, regarding sexual energies and sexual passions. Yes, that's part of it, because these things were not awakened uh, to a high degree prior to puberty setting in. So yes, both the, the boy who's become a man and the woman who's become, the girl who's become a woman, is now facing a whole new set of uh, emotional, biochemical experiences, such as desires that, that were not all that important to them before. Um, uh, the desire uh, to uh, mate, the, the, the interest, the heightened interest in members of uh, the opposite sex. And, but again, along with that comes a cacophony of confusing emotions uh, and, and confusing uh, changes in, in both the male's emotional state and the female's emotional state. There's often a kind of roller coaster ride, uh, especially among young girls as they enter puberty. There's a, a roller coaster ride of emotions, of anger, of rage, of laughter, of, of happiness, of introspection um, that marks that transformational period in her life, and it can be quite intense. And for the young boy who becomes a man, it may have lesser intensity, but there is also, for the young male who becomes a man, uh, a tremendous <clears throat> roller coaster of emotions expressed differently than the female. For the male, there's often uh, a lot of rebellion and uh, 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 tests of manhood. Uh, the, 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 the facial hair that come that, that is on his face and, and things like shaving and all kinds of things. Um, so these accompanying changes in both the female, the young girl who becomes a woman, and the young boy who becomes a man, there's an accompanying set of changes that are not just what we would classify as sexual or uh, connected with sexual desire in nature, although that plays a very big role. There's, there's, there's a whole set of confusing emotions because they have now gone from being children to adults. And they now, partially through biochemistry, are thinking, beginning to think like adults. Um, and their core identity has changed. They, they desire to assert themselves. They're no longer content to be perceived and to behave like little children. Uh, they know that they, they have become biologically men and women. And so they want to be men and women, and not just in the sense of procreation or sexuality. They want to be men and women in terms of their identity, in terms of calling the shots, in terms of independence, uh, in terms of assertiveness, in ter terms of inquisitiveness and exploration and all kinds of things. So this time period in life is often characterized by rebellion. Also, there is a uh, or, or often is a significant change in the relationship between the girl who's become a woman and the boy who's become a man. There's a significant change in the relationship that the boy has with his father, if the father is present, that the boy has with his mother, assuming the mother is present. And there's also a significant change in the nature of the relationship between the uh, girl who has become a woman and her father, and the girl who has become a woman and her mother. So it's the time of upheaval and, and transformation and the renegotiation of power and the, and, the, and the reordering of relationships. Their friends are also going through a similar process because people usually attend school in, in certain similar age categories, which we call grades. And so their friends will be displaying similar things. And so in our culture, especially uh, what we would call American culture, 
I would say that these roller coaster like changes, these fundamental changes in their core identity, are amplified because American culture, uh, sadly to say, is devoid of, or is absent of, or is missing um, what other cultures had. Cultures like the Jewish culture, especially. Um, the American culture is devoid and missing um, appropriate rituals. And not, when I say rituals, I'm not talking about worshiping idols. Please understand me. I'm talking about rituals, appropriate rituals, appropriate ceremonies, appropriate rites of passage. See, we don't have that in our culture. This has been observed by many people, and it causes a problem. Because, for example, although a young boy becomes a man, uh, many cultures, if not most cultures, have rituals, ceremonies, uh, rites of passage. The ancient Israelites had rituals and, and, and ceremonies to celebrate to both celebrate and to authenticate and to signify the the surrounding community, the parents um, would participate in Jewish rituals which were designed to transition the boy into manhood, and that boy would participate in various ceremonies, and in the process of the ceremonies, there was a, a public ritual in which that boy was uh, uh, identified by the religious leader and his family as now becoming a man. And so, in other words, the title of manhood was conferred upon him in an official sense. And that provides a great relief. Instead of it being an ambiguity, you're participating in a rite where manhood is conferred upon you. And in the same way, the female goes through uh, certain rites and ceremonies and religious ceremonies where she doesn't just ambiguously wonder, due to biolo biological changes, has she become a woman? The rabbi and the religious leaders and the parents and the family gather together in a ceremony, in a celebration, uh, where she's officially acknowledged as having become a woman. Now, you may not think this is significant, but in, ter in terms of boys and girls, men and women, and humanity in, in general, people have identities. And if there is no official recognition or celebration or authentication of their transformation into manhood or womanhood, it becomes a very nebulous thing, which, which the, in which the byproduct is rebellion. The byproduct is sex outside of marriage. The byproduct is drugs and promiscuity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because, why? Because there's no official <coughs> cultural ceremonial outlet that's healthy that confers upon the child becoming a young man or a uh, young woman. There's no official ceremony to authenticate that, to empower that, to affirm that. What we have is people going to the movies and listening to pop music, and, and that's a very cheap counterfeit of this transformational moment. Society, when it's healthy, will celebrate the transformation and equip the identity of the boy or girl to be a man or to be a woman. And then <clears throat> it's necessary for the good of the boy or girl for them to have uh, it conferred upon them by their own community that now, yes, you indeed have officially now become a woman, and they're going to celebrate that with you. Or yes, indeed, you have now become a man, and we're going to officially celebrate that with you. See, this is a positive thing, and it's heavily found in the Jewish culture, 
but it's also found in the Islamic culture. It's, it's found to one degree or another in the Catholic culture. It's found in cultures all over the world. It should be found in the Christian culture, but it's not. And that's not something God wants, by the way, because this, these are important matters. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. In a moment, we're going to get back to the power of identity and why it is so important for the culture around a child who becomes a man or a woman, for that culture, including their parents and people of authority, to, in a ceremonial sense, confer upon them and recognize that they have indeed become a man or a woman, and how the fact that it is recognized that you are a man or a woman, not just because of biological changes, but because you are both spiritually and in terms of your identity, recognize that you've become both a man or a woman, that process actually functions as a mechanism to release you to become your identity, to release you to become a man, to release you to become a woman. And therefore, it becomes a blessing. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in a second. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. This program you might want to send to somebody, send the link to somebody who needs to hear it. In the Jewish culture, and I'm, I'm more than relatively familiar with the Jewish culture because When I grew up as a boy, I grew up in Jackson Heights, Queens, which was predominantly a Jewish neighborhood. Now, it was also a Catholic neighborhood, but if you attended public school, which I did, uh, the majority of the students were Jewish. So when I was growing up uh, in Queens, all of my friends were Jewish. I had, I can't remember having a Catholic friend. And um, it was a blessing to me because I got exposed to a religion. I got exposed to the the truth of Judaism um, in a way that I never would have if if I was just looking at it from the outside. So one of the things I remember was attending uh, the bar mitzvahs and the mop mitzvahs of both the uh, young boys and girls in what would be called a Jewish rite of passage. So depending upon whether somebody's reformed or not in the Jewish tradition, uh, a boy uh, uh, receives and goes through a bar mitzvah at the age of 13 years old. And a girl uh, will either go through a bar mitzvah, which is for females, at the age of 12 years old or 13 years old. And essentially, it's an official rite of passage. It's, it's in a religious uh, initiation ceremony, which publicly acknowledges, for example, during a bar mitzvah, that a Jewish boy who has reached the age of 13, he is now regarded and ready to observe religious precepts, and he becomes eligible uh, at that time to take part in public worship. But it's more than that. Um, When a Jewish boy is 13 years old and goes through bar mitzvah, he is now officially recognized as an adult. He becomes officially accountable for his actions. And so it's it's a spiritual rite, which is a passage into manhood. And so when a Jewish young man at the age of 13, goes through a bar mitzvah, he is officially recognized as becoming a man. Now that is a good thing, and that's a blessing, because a lot of young men don't feel like men. They're, they're confused. I'm not talking about confused in terms of sexual identity, they're just confused. But you see, having a, a ceremony, having a, a rite of passage, having a ritual tied into your spiritual beliefs, This is when the community around him, including his relatives and his parents and his friends, officially gather together and declare publicly that, no, you're no longer a boy. 
you now officially have become a man. And this uh, rite of passage liberates the young boy to become a man. It's a good thing, and it's a necessary thing. Now, females in the Jewish culture, beginning at 12 years old or 13 years old, depending upon the tradition, they too go through a coming-of-age ritual and uh, called the Bar Mitzvah. And uh, there is also a ceremony where they are officially recognized as no longer being uh, girls, but they're officially recognized as being uh, women. And it's not an accident that the, that the Bar Mitzvah and the Bar Mitzvah takes place in the general time period uh, of which a, a boy goes through puberty and becomes a man, and a girl goes through puberty and becomes a woman. It's an official rite of passage. And once again, I would say it's, it's, it's a good thing. Now, it also, in, in Jewish culture, along with this uh, public recognition by the community that you've now become a man or a woman, because, look, let, let's face it, what, what are so many of the fights about in, in, in especially Gentile or non-Jewish uh, uh, households? What are so many of the fights about when children go through puberty, when a boy or a girl goes through puberty, uh, when they become what's called <clears throat> teenagers? Um, there's often a, uh, a degree of conflict in the home. And what is the degree of conflict about? It's always about the battle for power between the daughter and her mother, or the daughter and her father and mother, or the son and his father, or the son and his father and mother. There's a power struggle. There's, there's a battle of power. Because you see, there's this, especially in Gentile or non-Christian households, there's this ambiguity hanging in the air. Um, because nobody has really officially decreed that your child <laughs> is either a boy or a man or, or, or a girl or a woman. And so, you know, raging with hormones, going through uh, uh, mind changes and biological changes, they, they naturally want to assert themselves because they are becoming biologically men and women. And so they want to take ownership of their lives, etc. And so there's, there's a power struggle, there's a battle. But part of the power struggle and the battle has to do with there's confusion created uh, by, inadvertently, the parents aren't doing it on purpose, but there's a confusion created by the parents, by the religious community they, they belong to in many cases, especially if it's a Christian religious community or if it's even a, a secular, atheistic community, there's confusion. Are you a boy or a girl, or are you a, 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 a fully grown woman or a fully grown man? And so the bar mitzvah and the bar mitzvah settle this issue. So along with conferring upon the young boy manhood and the young girl uh, or womanhood, they are now, um, before their parents and before their community, um, they, the, the child who now has become uh, an adult, and this is a key thing because we don't have this in the Gentile world, uh, at the age of 13, or at the age of 12 in some Jewish religious communities, uh, boys and girls now officially, and in some cases legally, bear their own responsibility for all their actions. They bear their own responsibility for keeping the Jewish ritual law, tradition, and ethics. And they are also able to participate fully in all areas of Jewish community life. So, for example, traditionally, the father of the bar mitzvah gives thanks to God that he's no longer punished for the child's sins. In addition to being considered accountable for their actions, 
from a religious perspective, a 13-year-old male may be counted towards um, uh, an Orthodox prayer quorum and may now officially lead prayer and religious services in the family and the community. So, this is uh, a a coming-of-age passage and one that's important. Now, when you don't have, and you have, you have a form of this in Catholicism, but it is not as solid. You have things, for example, like communion, confirmation. I went through confirmation because of my grandmother who wanted me to. And that happens, I guess, roughly around the time you're 13. I can't remember. But it is not as a marked ceremony. Um, uh, my purpose is not to really just. My purpose is not to put down Catholicism, but the Jews have thought out their system better than the Catholics have. And tragically to say, and and again, I don't like to really constantly criticize Christians, but uh, they have have not thought out their theological system. They don't really have the rites of passage that they should have. Uh, And then, of course, in atheistic, agnostic, and secular communities, It's like the Twilight Zone. Nobody knows what they are uh, because they don't acknowledge God and and it's never officially conferred upon a young man or a woman that you have indeed gone from being a little girl to a woman or being a little boy to a man. Now, what we have in our secular, atheistic, and and often the case, sadly, Christian culture or even in some other religious cultures, because there's no official rite of passage, What you have emerging in the culture is what we would call a counterfeit rite of passage. And in the counterfeit rite of passage, which is all too common, tragically, in American culture and Western culture, since there is no official spiritual transition or no official spiritual bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah, where a a child becomes... uh, uh, an adult and, and and has responsibilities and authority conferred upon him or her. What happens is you have a counterfeit uh, um, rite of passage, and the counterfeit rite of passions passage that emerges in Western nations and nations like the like America is okay. So you you start to hit puberty or you hit puberty, all right? And this is all unspoken, but this is how it plays out. So then you enter, because you've made the transformation biologically from uh, boy to man, from girl to woman, you, you now go out in a secular, atheistic, humanistic culture. You now go out and celebrate your, your biological manhood and your biological womanhood. You celebrate it in a counterfeit manner by using your body or expressing your body sexually because biologically you now have changed. You're a sexual being. So instead of channeling that rite of passage in a healthy and a positive spiritual way, you do it in a counterfeit way. You go out and lose your virginity. That's the negative counterfeit rite of passage. You go out and have sex or you become sexually promiscuous for a season. Uh, You go out and party and get drunk and take drugs. Now, I'm not kidding about this. Because there's no official spiritual rite of passage, and there is a need in every human being, especially boys and girls, to, to be recognized for the transition, a counterfeit emerges. And that counterfeit emerges based on, and it draws its roots from, ancient pagan occultic societies. Isn't that tragic? Because, for example, the Christian church, and I mean be blunt, because the Christian church can't get its act together, and that's really what it is, because the Christian church can't get its act together and uh, celebrate <clears throat> the transformation of a boy into a man and a girl into a woman and and provide a powerful, authentic, empowering uh, uh, rite of passage, uh, which is officially recognized by the parents and community. So 
by default, they, they make room for the devil. Because they will not involve themselves in something that God would like to see them involve themselves in. The children, their children become teenagers. And the norm, the new normal among teenagers in America from atheistic, humanistic households or lukewarm Christian households or lukewarm Jewish households, etc., is a counterfeit rite of passage where uh, young boys and girls, when their bodies change into women and men, they go out, have sex, they lose their virginity or have sexual experiences, get drunk, take drugs, and that's their rite of passage. It's a destructive rite of passage. And if you look back into ancient history, you will see that these activities just didn't come out of the middle of nowhere, <clears throat> that they were actually <clears throat> imitated from are borrowed from ancient pagan, ancient occultic um, cultures. So if you go back to ancient Canaan, or you go back to ancient Babylon, or you go back to ancient Chaldea, which, which was into Wicca and magic, and many of these other ancient cultures, you go back to the Druids, you go back to uh, any number of ancient occultic cultures, what you will see is that the ancient occultic pagan cultures did have an official occultic, magical, witchcraft-type ceremony to celebrate the rite of passage, which involved sexual immorality, uh, using, uh, losing your virginity, taking drugs, getting drunk, and then uh, consecrating yourself and invoking demons or participating in some kind of demonic uh, occultic ritual. So, <clears throat> uh, in modern witchcraft today, which is the fastest growing religion in America, they have to one degree or another in Wicca and witchcraft what could be called rite of passage uh, uh, witchcraft or Wiccan ceremonies or rituals that are tied to the seasons, that are tied to nature. And depending upon the witchcraft tradition, or whether it's Satanism or whether, whether, whatever, or depending upon the Wiccan uh, tradition, there is an official recognition by the witchcraft community or the Wiccan community that the child is no longer a, a girl, but a woman, that the, the boy is no longer a um, boy, but a man. And so they have an official occultic ritual to, to authenticate and to affirm manhood and womanhood, and it usually involves an occultic ritual, the calling on of demons, magical spells, and often, uh, as part of that, is uh, uh, some form of, of sexual experience or sexual initiation outside of marriage. Now, before people wave their f fingers in, in condemnation of this kind of activity, let's remember something. If the Christian church is, is offering nothing in terms of a rite of passage, and has no rite of passage, or ignores the need for a rite of passage, then how can you possibly blame your, your teenagers or whatever, how can you blame them if they run off to participate in pagan ceremonies, Wicca ceremonies, and witchcraft ceremonies, which authenticate their manhood and womanhood? And since you've offered them nothing in the way of legitimate true spirituality, how can you blame them when they, when they open themselves up to demonic rituals, Wiccan rituals, and witchcraft rituals. You can't. You can't, because you, it's your responsibility. You failed. See? You didn't, you didn't stand up to the plate and deliver. Now, I want to add something. I, I read about these things, and I think they're well-intentioned, where Christian communities across the nation try to develop a, a, an alternative rite of passage for males and females in which they climb mountains or they do something rigorous or they 
They go through some test to prove that they're men or women, and then through prayer or whatever, uh, um, it is conferred upon them by the community that they are now women and men. I think that's a step in the right direction. I think that's a step in a healthy direction. The only thing I would add to it is that um, since there is no uh, prevailing ceremony, as somebody who's filled with the Holy Spirit and loves the Lord, you may have to develop your own ceremony. And by developing your own ceremony, what I would suggest is number the one the number one rule would be is I'm serious. I'm very serious about what I'm saying. You may laugh and think it's funny, but I'm dead serious because I understand, and I think you understand the acute sensitivities of teenagers. So number one is, whatever your rite of passage is, it should not be lame or embarrassing. That's the number one rule. Don't make it lame or embarrassing. Number two is, make it powerful. Make it authentic. Make it something that that a teenager would want to participate in. Uh, Then make it spiritually powerful. And by making it spiritually powerful, let me, let me suggest this to you, okay? And I, I'm extremely serious about what I'm saying here. I, I really feel that the Lord has given me a very strong burden of the Holy Spirit to communicate this biblical truth to you. I started out wanting to communicate to you the differences and the need for a rite of passage in terms of identity, and we're still going to get into the topic of identity. Because identity is everything. You see, we're created in the image of God. But if we don't know that, then we're void of identity. And people that are void of identity become powerless, confused, dismayed, and lost. Okay. God had children. Let's let's just put it this way. God's children were Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, obviously, God's children, his first children, Adam and Eve, were not biologically children. They were men and women. And that needs to be said emphatically. Adam was a man. Eve was a woman. They were fully mature adults. They were fully of childbearing age. They weren't going through puberty. They just didn't finish puberty. Adam was a full man, and Eve was a full woman. So I'm using the idea that they were God's children as somewhat as a metaphor in the same way we would say we're all children of God. All right? Now, Adam, excuse me, God, what did God do with Adam and Eve? He gave them the supernatural power to rule and reign over planet Earth. So they were equipped with the supernatural intelligence, the supernatural wisdom, the supernatural power to rule and reign the Garden of Eden, which is paradise, and planet Earth. This is a very important spiritual concept. So God gave them supernatural authority, supernatural power to rule and reign over planet Earth. This is essential to understand in terms of our identity. So what does this mean? It means that if we go back to the purpose of uh, a Jewish bar mitzvah for boys or bar mitzvah for girls, again, I'm not Jewish, but, but I participated in many bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs when I was a kid. And one of the one of the purposes of a bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah is that when a, your girl or boy is th- about thirteen years old, they go through the ritual of the bar mitzvah or the bar mitzvah, and um, which is usually around the time they go through puberty. And during this ceremony, their parents, their community, their rabbi. Uh, and all the people, the relatives, now officially recognize that 
the once little boy and the once little girl have now transformed, and it is publicly affirmed, it is publicly authenticated, and it is publicly declared that they are now, the girl is now a woman, and the boy is now a man. So there's a public recognition of the change and transformation of their identity. In addition, they now are fully responsible for their actions. In addition, they are able to participate in the spiritual life of the community. And in some cases, going back, you know, many, many centuries ago, I don't know what the exact age requirements were, so I want to be careful. Um, I'll stay away from it, because quite honestly, off the top of my head, I don't remember what the official age was for a young Jewish boy or a young Jewish girl to get married, and I don't want to communicate inappropriately there. But the point is, they, they became adults, and through the Bar Mitzvah and Bar Mitzvah, they became adults, they were given the authority. Uh, they were given the, the authority to make decisions. They were uh, responsible for their actions. Now think about that for a moment. The Catholics have a somewhat similar rites of passage, but it really is not clear cut because the Jewish tradition. Uh, or the Jewish rituals are tied into biological puberty and the biological transformation uh, of the girl becoming a woman and the boy becoming a man. Now, when a Catholic uh, when Catholics go through confirmation, it, it is loosely tied to puberty, but it's not as definitively tied towards puberty. So, what we have here is 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 a is a ritual. That I believe, now I'm not a Jewish uh, rabbi, obviously, but it's a ritual that I believe is tied to Adam and Eve in Genesis. Adam and Eve didn't go through a transition from being, Eve was not a girl and then became a woman. Adam was not a boy and then became a man. I'm talking about in the general sense, they were the children of God. But God gave them the full supernatural power and authority to rule and reign the Garden of Eden and planet Earth, and they were accountable for their actions. So there is some similarity to the rite of passage in Bar Mitzvah and Bar Mitzvah, and and the state of, of spiritual authority and responsibility and being that Adam and Eve had. Okay? And I'm not going to take it further than it should go. So, what does that mean? What it means is, God the Father gave Adam and Eve the full authority. Now, remember, Adam and Eve were fully a woman. I mean, Eve was fully a woman, and Adam was fully a man. But along with that, they were given the supernatural authority to exercise dominion and to rule and reign over the Garden of Eden and planet Earth. This is a key, key truth. Because God says, and God made man in his own image, in the image of man he made them both male and female. So they had the authority to rule and reign over planet Earth, to control over planet Earth, to have dominion over planet Earth. Very, very important. Now, when a kid, okay, so when a kid is a child, a boy or a girl, um, the children, as boys and girls, do not have full authority. They do not have full uh, dominion. They, they have not been given fully the keys of the kingdom. They have not been given the full power to tread upon serpents. They have not been given the full power to uh, uh, rule and reign over, over planet Earth or whatever. They have to defer to their parents' authority. They have to come under their parents' covering. You see, they're, they're protected by their parents' authority. 
and their parents' uh, covering and their parents' dominion. But when they go through puberty, they go through an identity change. Puberty represents a biological identity change in which the boy and girl are no longer a boy and a girl. They're now a fully grown man and a fully grown woman. When that happens, there's psychological, biological, and spiritual changes which also occur. This is represented in the bar mitzvah or the bar mitzvah of the Jews, where they, they're accountable for their actions and they've been given the full authority to participate in the life of their community. They've been given authority. So, Adam and Eve have the full authority. Now, the point of this is that every man and woman of God, um, beginning with Adam and Eve, and we know Adam and Eve temporarily lost their authority because they disobeyed God uh, and they ate from the tree in the middle of the garden. <clears throat> but God began his redemptive process and eventually sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for their sins in a substitutionary death. <clears throat> and in Christ, every believer by faith in Christ uh, discovers that that supernatural authority has been reinstated and restored in Christ so that dominion, that ability to rule and reign, has been restored by faith in Christ. And so <clears throat> every man or woman who's born again is a new creature in Christ Jesus. They're, they're operating, if you will, <clears throat> in a similar authority that Adam and Eve did before the fall. So that's the point here. When we are truly men and women of God, not little children, when we are men and women of God, we understand that we're responsible for our actions, but as authentic men and women of God, once we are born again, because this this authentic uh, this off uh, authenticity as men and women, women of God can't fully come into being until after we're born again and we become a new creature in Christ Jesus. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and are born again and we're regenerated by the Spirit of God and we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, God confers upon us a restoration of, of the spiritual authority that he gave Adam and Eve before they lost it in the Garden of Eden through disobedience. So, you and I, if we have our faith in Christ and are born again, God has reinstated in us the keys of the kingdom. We have been given back our supernatural authority to rule and reign in planet Earth. We've been given back our supernatural authority to... Uh, uh, tread upon serpents and scorpions, and we can exercise the same authority that Christ had when he ministered on the earth. This is very, very powerful and very, very important. So, what does this mean? What this means is before we're born again, we are, in a sense, somewhat like children, spiritually. Because before we're born again, we really don't have an inner revelation, nor do we have a valid experience <clears throat> of seeing the supernatural authority that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden reinstated in our personalities. Why? Because we're not yet born again. You see, Adam and Eve had the full authority to rule and reign planet Earth in the Garden of Eden, the supernatural wisdom of God, and all the other gifts that Adam and Eve had <clears throat> were fully operative in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because the presence of the Lord filled them and they walked in the presence of the Lord. There was no disconnect. 
There was no power cord of the life force unplugged in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> Adam and Eve lost their supernatural authority to rule and reign in planet Earth in the Garden of Eden when they disobeyed the word of God by eating from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. At that moment, they activated the death force or the law of sin and death, which it was the kill switch on the life force. They became powerless. They became, at that moment, mere mortal women and men. They became just natural, ordinary men and women. Every person born today is born with the fallen nature of Adam and Eve, and every person born today with the fallen nature of Adam and Eve is born from birth as just merely an ordinary man or woman without the spiritual power of God. And under the curse, because every man and woman born today is in the process of degrading and dying. When we choose to become born again by putting our faith in Christ, asking Jesus Christ to cleanse us of our sins with his blood, and we invite Christ into our lives to make us born again, that at that moment we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. We become brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. At that moment, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, at that moment, we, we become brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. This is so important. This is so important. At that moment that we're born again and invite Christ in our lives to make us born again and the Holy Spirit fills us, at that moment we become brand new creatures in, in Christ Jesus and at that moment we also become joint heirs with Jesus. This is so powerful and so significant that we have to grasp it with a vengeance. So, we become brand new creatures in Christ Jesus, and we become joint heirs with Jesus. Who's Jesus? He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. That means instantaneously, by faith, as the Spirit of God comes in us and we become new creatures in Christ Jesus, not only are we born again, But we now have been reinstated to be joint heirs with Jesus, which means that we are now new creatures in Christ Jesus. And as new creatures in Christ Jesus, not only has God given us back the authority Adam and Eve lost, but God has given us back our title, our place, because we're joint heirs with Jesus. We're now part of God's royal family. And as joint heirs with Jesus, we have the legal right to sit on thrones in the throne room of God. You and I will be sitting on thrones next to Jesus. We will be ruling and reigning with Jesus for all eternity. That's our position and title. See? Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But when we're born again, we are the kings and queens under the king of kings in heaven. And not only that, we have all our authority reinstated to us. We're joint heirs with Jesus. We're also priest kings and priest queens. But as joint heirs with Jesus, we not only have the right legally to sit on the throne next to Jesus, We have the legal right to rule and reign with Jesus. But as joint heirs with Jesus, we are the legal recipients of the vast, infinite inheritance that is Jesus Christ. You see, God has given Jesus Christ an infinite inheritance. We have no words to describe the the, the glory of, the wealth of the inheritance that is ours in Christ Jesus. But we now become joint heirs with Jesus. So everything Jesus gets as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we get as kings and queens under the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we're joint heirs with Jesus. And part of that means we have kingdom authority, full kingdom authority. Whatever we bind on heaven will be bound on earth. Whatever we loose in heaven will be loosed on earth. So now in full authority, 
there's a recognition <clears throat> that we are the sons and daughters of God. Not in the sense of being little children, but being in the family of God. And, 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 and inheriting all the power and authority that being part of the royal family of God represents for all eternity. So what this means is, and this is where we need to allow, this is where you need to allow right now the Holy Spirit to come upon you. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to come upon you. You need to allow the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you and open your eyes to your inheritance, to open your eyes to the fullness of your new identity and to open your eyes to who you really are in Christ. Because none of what I'm about to say to you is mythological. None of, about, of what I'm about to say to you is a fairy tale. It is true truth. It is final reality. It is yours in the courts of heaven. You see what a liar Satan is? Satan steals everything, makes you a pauper and beggar, gives you nothing, and people are following him like crazy. What total fools they are. What total fools they are. So you are a joint heir with Jesus. You have the full authority that Jesus has down here on earth. Therefore, you must allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to penetrate your heart and mind and renew or make new your core identity. You must begin to see yourself in the very fullness of that God sees you. There should be no disparity between how you see yourself and how God sees you. See, you shouldn't be seeing yourself as, as some orphan. You need to see yourself exactly how God sees you. Because it is how God sees you which represents the truth of, of, who, of who you really are. So, what is in the core of your identity is of utmost importance. If you think, if you have confusion about who you really are, you cannot operate in the fullness of who you really are. In order for you to fully be the man and woman that God created you to be, you must understand, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of who you are in Christ Jesus. You must understand the anointing God has put on you. You must understand that you are clothed with power from on high. You must understand that you are a recipient of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that you're a recipient of natural gifts. And you must understand that as a son and daughter of God, that you have the same authority as Jesus Christ has, that you are a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And that means, as you walk upon this earth, as you deal with daily problems, you have to understand that you are filled with absolutely awesome power, awesome intelligence, awesome creativity, awesome potential. <clears throat> and these are not fairy tale words. This is a truthful account based on the Word of God of who you are in your core identity. And what you must do is recognize that who you are in your daily life should be matched up to who you are in your core identity because that's, because that's who you really are. So, so when Jesus Christ says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, this means a number of things, but one of the things that it means is that the truth of who you are in Christ Jesus, the truth of who you are in the kingdom of God, and you need to allow the truth of who you are in the kingdom of God to liberate you and empower you. Let me read you some verses. Um, in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says this, verse 5, 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What that means is that God predestinated you before the beginning of time to be adopted of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So you were adopted by Christ into his family according to his good pleasure. In verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. This is powerful stuff. This is very, very powerful stuff. And then it says uh, in verse 10, that in, the dispensa- in, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. You see, you have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own um, will. Now, it says in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. This is dunamis. This is dynamite. This is so powerful that that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, yes, that's you, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That means right now, at this second, you have the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Him. And not only that, verse 18 says, this is what you also have. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That means, you see, you think you're going through life and struggles by yourself. You cry out to God, you experience weariness, you, 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 you feel like sometimes you're stuck in a, in, a, in a dryer with the dryer cycle going and you're just spinning around in hopelessness and all of that is a lie because God is telling you right now at this second what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, that's you, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. See, there is an enormous spiritual power at work in you. Don't allow this present world system with its secular humanist thinking and its blah, 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 mass media and Satanism and witchcraft and the occult, don't allow it to steal from you the reality that you have enormous, enormous spiritual power in you and operating through you and the way you access it, access it is by simple faith. Let me read you something again. Um, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at, is at work in your life at this very moment. Okay? And Jesus Christ has been uh, is sitting... And you are sitting next to Jesus Christ right now. You're sitting, you have, you have a dual citizenship. Part of you is walking out around here on earth, and the other part of you is seated next to Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne in heavenly places. At this present moment, that's where part of you is located. You're sitting far above all principality, power, might, and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, heaven. And Jesus Christ has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. In other words, you're part of the supernatural body of Christ, and as part of the supernatural body of Christ, the feet of Christ 
you are using the feet of Christ to tread upon every one of your adversaries. So, I mean, we could go on and on. It's just so completely mind-blowing. Now, here's the point that I want to get to, and I want to share with you. Don't think for a moment that I'm using flowery spiritual words. I'm not. Those words were crafted for a different century. But essentially what they mean is is that in the core of your identity, God wants you to know who you really, really are, not who people think you are, in the core of your identity. And who you really are in the core of your identity. This is not a fairy tale. It's not something out of a Star Wars sequel. It is who you really are. Who you really are in in your core identity is you are an awesome son and daughter of God. And I pray that as I say those words to you, the power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of the Holy Spirit would come upon the words that I'm saying to you and that the truthfulness of those words and the power of those words and those life of, and the life of those words would explode into reality in your inner man and woman. You see, everything we do in life, what we become, what we're able to accomplish, how we deal with problems, um, Um, Are we able to overcome problems? Everything that we do and accomplish in life or everything we, we don't become or don't accomplish in life goes back to a basic kingdom principle. And that is the kingdom principle of your core identity. In the Bible, it says... As a man or a woman thinketh, so is he. In other words, what you believe about yourself is really who you are. This is way, way, way beyond positive thinking. This is not about, well, gee, if I think positive uh, affirmational things about myself, that that's going to come into being. And if I think negative things about myself, that's going to come to being. That does happen on a particular level. But if you want to enter into the highest level of power, release, fruitfulness of who you really are, if you want to see God release who you really are in life, if you want to see God release who your children and grandchildren really are in life, and if you want to see America, see there's so many Christians running around who are terrified about what's going to happen in America right now. Well, you or whoever you know running around being terrified about what's happening to America right now isn't going to accomplish anything. You must have a revelation of who you really are in Christ and you must understand just how powerful the power and authority God has given you in your inner man or woman in your life at this moment and how God has given you the privilege and the right and authority to utilize your absolutely extraordinary supernatural power. You have the ability to use and to release your supernatural power to such an extent that God has given you the power and authority to change the direction and future of America. That's right. Don't be afraid of it and don't shirk from it. I'm not saying that you've been given the power to to overcome God's sovereign will. Those are two different things. But where God has not outlined for us what his sovereign will is, God has given you the supernatural power and authority to effect a game changer in America, a game changer in your own personal life and family, a game changer in any situation where you choose to call upon God's power. God is willing and able and desirous of stepping into your reality and stepping into any reality that you call him to step into by faith. In other words, 
as a new creature in Christ Jesus, as a man or a woman who right now is walking in this earth, but simultaneously you are seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ, as a joint heir with Jesus, you are the heir to infinite resources and power. And at any time you choose, as a joint heir with Jesus Christ, you have been, been given the ability in the courts of heaven as a legal heir to appropriate the infinite supernatural power, the infinite resources of the kingdom of heaven, and release them into any area, any situation, or any person's life on planet earth. Therefore, God has given you the awesome and incredible authority to supernaturally call upon his name, and on the basis of the fact that you are calling upon his name, Jesus Christ is willing to supernaturally intervene in any event or any situation in people's lives or in planet earth. The only thing <clears throat> that is required is that you step out by faith and ask God to supernaturally intervene. In other words, God has given you enormous authority. All you have to do is use childlike faith to release the power of God through, your chi- through the childlike faith, which will release enormous authority. This all comes out of your identity. This all comes out of who you think you are. This all comes out of who do you believe you are. This is so important. You know, this is not complicated. The the enormous multidimensional truth I'm sharing with you now does not uh, derive from some complex, analytical, scientific, philosophical study of the Word of God. How you get access to this kind of power and authority is is not through the wisdom of the world. You get access to this kind of power and authority by simply using your childlike faith. In other words, if you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you can bring into reality all of the things that I just discussed with you. You don't need to be some big shot. You don't need to be some theologian. All you need to have is childlike faith. A mustard seed of faith. And if you will use or utilize your childlike faith, your mustard seed of faith, you will move massive mountains in the invisible realm and you can change the future And you can change your destiny and mankind's destiny. Once again, I am not inferring that you can overcome and override God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will will stand. But in the area, in the areas where God has not decreed to us what his sovereign will is, God has given us the divine privilege of using the keys of the kingdom to transform the future and to transform reality. But on top of that, you don't have to erroneously fear stepping over the line regarding God and your faith in prayer. Why? Because you have to trust the fact that when you pray to God and you believe God for the impossible, you have to trust the fact and you also have to be humble enough to understand that God is God. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. You're not. I'm not. I'm not God. You're not God. So if by chance you prayed, let's say, a very bold prayer, and that prayer happened to contradict what God's sovereign will was, or that prayer happened to be something that, if he brought it to pass, would be against his will, Don't be so arrogant and don't be so proud. Don't assume that God has given you the power to override his sovereign will. If, for example, you do make a mistake 
and you pray in such a way that you would release, that, that you would require God to do something that would override his will or, or override his sovereign plan, you're not supposed to be afraid. Simply trust the fact that God will allow you to pray, but trust the fact that God is fully aware of the fact that he's King of kings and Lord of lords. And so God will simply decide not to answer your prayer. God will simply say no to your prayer. God will simply shut your prayer down. You don't have to worry. I mean, just think about how arrogant and prideful it is to be running around being worried about whether or not you're going to pray a prayer <clears throat> that's going to undo the will of God or undo the sovereign will of God. That's complete nonsense. If you happen to pray a prayer that, that if it was to actually be answered, would undo the sovereign will of God or the will of God, God's not going to even let that come close to happening. Let's understand that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ will choose to shut down your prayer. Jesus Christ will choose to not answer your prayer. And that's his right. He's God. And therefore, whenever you pray regarding anything, you never have to fear for even a moment's notice that you're going to override the sovereign will of God or that somehow the arrogance I hear is absolutely stunning. People talking to me and and actually telling me that they're afraid of praying this prayer and that prayer because they don't want to undo Bible prophecy. Well, I, I hate to break it to you, how incredibly arrogant you are in the first place to think that you could ever pray a prayer that would undo God's prophetic plan, that would undo God's uh, uh, plan for Bible prophecy, or that would undo God's will. Let's rest in the fact that if you make a prayer that is against the will of God, that is against the sovereignty of God, or is against the prophetic plan of God, God is fully capable, as God, of stopping and blocking that prayer. And in case it hasn't occurred to you, God has been stopping and blocking and delaying the prayers of his people for centuries. Not because he's, he's trying to cultivate a climate of unbelief, but because we have to recognize that whenever we pray to our Heavenly Father, he's God and, he's, and we're not. So we trust him. And, and because we trust him, we trust that he will shut down or say no to prayers that are contrary to his will. So, so the whole debate is rather, is rather ridiculous in the first place. But back to your core identity. Adam and Eve knew who they were before God. They knew that they were given the supernatural power to rule and reign on planet Earth. Right now in America, we're facing the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. But the vast majority of God's people are not using the enormous supernatural power and wisdom that God has given them to defeat the enemy and win this greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. That's why I devote so much time in my brand new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, I devote so many chapters into teaching you in simple, fast-moving, and hopefully entertaining terms exactly how you can appropriate by faith the enormous supernatural power of God and how God has given you the power to change the future, to call upon him so that he will supernaturally intervene and change what is going on in America. I mean, the entire book, The Greatest Battle, uh, from beginning to end, starts with the pilgrims and Puritans and their covenant with God that establish America as a unique nation but how God's prophetic plan for America, and God does have a prophetic plan for America, as he has a prophetic plan for you, is under all-out attack. But as my book points out, through historical documentation and, and incredible research, as my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, points out, 
God is waiting for you and he's waiting for me to exercise that mustard seed of faith and together when we do that we can call upon God to supernaturally intervene in his game plan for America and God is waiting for us this is, this is the, a sober call God is waiting for us through prayer and through obedience to release the prophetic destiny for America that God had in mind before the foundation of the world's of the world. You can help me spread the truth of that message by visiting paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. I praise God for all of you that came out to the Paradise Mountain Church meeting uh, just a couple of days ago. Power from on high <clears throat> entered the meeting. The Lord poured out his Holy Spirit in revival in the meeting. There were people uh, there from many different areas and as we met together, as we sought the Lord together, as I gave an extended time of teaching Bible prophecy, the presence of the Lord invaded the room. People were healed, they were saved, they were delivered, and, and some people were touched uh, profoundly by the power of God. Now, as most of you know, I don't cultivate uh, an hysterical atmosphere of sensationalism or emotionalism. I try to stay anchored to the Word of God. But as I endeavor to lead the people and anchor them to the Word of God, I'm not going to shut down the supernatural power of Jesus Christ when he, when he moves among us. And God did move among us with this supernatural power. So if you missed last week's meeting, we have another Paradise Mountain Church meeting coming up in January. And all you have to do is go to paulmcguire.us, that's paulmcguire.us, and you'll see the date and the time and directions on how to get there. And remember, the Bible says, don't forsake uh, yourselves. I'm misquoting it, I apologize. But, but do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. A lot of people are burnt out because they're going to churches where they feel manipulated and abused. The one thing I have to, to share with you about Paradise Mountain Church is that one of the primary teachings I give on a regular basis is that all men will know that we're disciples if we love one another. And that is true not just for a local church, but that's true for us as Christians all over the world. Men will know and women will know that we're true followers of Jesus Christ. Um, if we love them and if we love one another. So it's on that note, I want to say God bless you and remember to seek the Lord and remember that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is returning soon. In the meantime, we're to occupy until he comes. God bless you. Visit paulmcguire.us. Send these messages out. They're free, obviously. Visit our Roku channel. We have a couple of hundred hours of Bible prophecy channel. Uh, uh, teaching and remember to join the YouTube channel become officially a follower of the public Facebook channel but uh, join the Twitter channel and we have so many other social media things for you to join. It's important for you to join them because we send out every week free videos free radio programs, free articles and so many free resources to bless you and many times people say to me, well, I didn't know you were speaking at a conference, you know, just a couple of miles from my house, Paul. Or I didn't know that you were on this channel or that channel. And, and we announce that for you, so you won't be in the dark. But you need to sign up and register and become a part of all of our different social media. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Paul